All right, good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for joining us for another great collaboration with the Addison Gallery of American Art. My name is Nicole Kramer and I am the Programming and Partnerships Manager at Memorial Hall Library in Andover. Um, I want to thank the libraries in Amesbury, Ashland, Rockport, Tuxbury, and West Newbury for joining in today's program. Um, I also want to thank the Addison Gallery for fostering great connections and allowing us to share their exhibitions and artwork with the wider community. The Addison Gallery is located on the campus of Phillips Academy here in Andover. It is free and open to the public. Um, so if you are close to Andover, I encourage you to visit the gallery to enjoy their regularly changing exhibitions in person. Uh, please note that they do close for the month of August, so you still have another week to enjoy their current exhibitions, including the one we will be virtually touring today. Uh, throughout today's program, please put any questions in the Q&A, and we will plan to address as many of them as we can at the end of the talk. Um, we are recording the program, and everyone who registered will receive a link to the recording tomorrow. Uh, today we are joined by Gordon Wilkins, the Robert M. Walker Curator at the Addison, to discuss the eclectic mix of works that comprise the Addison's founding collection. Uh, Gordon, as always, thank you for joining us. I will now turn things over to you. Thank you so much, Nicole. It's such a pleasure to welcome so many of you to this uh, program. We so value our collaborations with Memorial Hall Library and, and love that we are able to connect through them to so many people outside of the Andover bubble that we live in. Um, so today, as Nicole mentioned, I'm going to bring you through virtually um, laying the foundation, exploring the nucleus of the Addison's collection. And I realize there may be there's probably one too many metaphor uh, metaphors in that title, but you'll have to excuse me because both uh, foundation and nucleus were deployed to to really understand and comprehend at that time what was going on with this core collection of art that would morph over the years into what is now a collection of over twenty eight thousand objects uh, and one of the most important collections of American art across media in the world. So this is the building. Uh, that you're probably most familiar with if you have uh, ever visited us here at the Addison. This was taken just a few weeks before the museum opened to the public uh, during the second half of May in 1931. Um, and this building was completed, uh, you know, during the Depression, no expense was spared, and it was completed very, very quickly. Uh, but by the time that the museum was fit to move uh, works into the building, the curator and staff and the when I say staff, there was a curator and one or two assistants had uh, less than a week to install the entire building before the museum opened to the public. And mind you, the opening of the Addison was covered in all of the major newspapers, the New York Times, uh, VIPs from all around the country attended. So um, we, when we complain that we have you know, a month to turn over exhibitions, um, it's always good to remember that they had a week to install the building before, um, before the public entered for the first time. I'm getting way ahead of myself. Um, but this show uh, really looks at um, the founding of the Addison as we know it. Um, and so while you go, when you go into the Addison and you walk up these stairs in our, our fairly imposing temple front facade, Georgian Revival building, and you look above um, and you can see here this, uh, the, the pediment, um, you look at and you look up and you're exhorted by this uh, Latin phrase, res respicate artem patriae, which means uh, regard the art of country. And so you're, uh, as a visitor, you're, you're encouraged to look at the art of country, to look at the art of America. Uh, and that's what we do at the Addison. We are a museum of American art. I'll go into a lot more detail as to how American art is defined by the Addison institutionally. Um, but you are really uh, exhorted, you're extolled to respect and regard the art of country. Uh, but that leads to a lot of really fascinating questions and a lot of really generative questions. The foremost is whose country? How does one define the art of America, um, the art of the United States? Do you define it? Do you define it in terms of citizenship? Uh, do you define it in terms of uh, artists who have made lasting contributions to American culture, artists who have spent considerable amounts of time? are artists who were born in this country, uh, but left at an early age um, and worked elsewhere, but are technically American citizens. Is that American art? Uh, and also this, this definition of American art and of America in general is one that is certainly not fixed. Uh, it's one that's constantly evolving, one that uh, has uh, that's really uh, dependent on historical context, 
the definition of America and American art in 1928, when this core collection was first assembled, uh, is quite different than it is today, almost 100 years later. Uh, and this exhibition really looks at what was the state of American art in 1928, when Thomas Cochran, the Addison's founder, uh, was assembling this core collection. This uh, show is really um, uh, brought into being uh, after we were invited to participate uh, by the London Institute, which is an American art think tank up at Colby College, to participate in a symposium or in a project. We we ended up doing a symposium. Um, they were encouraging, or sorry, they were inviting six uh, institutions to um, respond to the question of of what is the state of American art. And so we had the opportunity to sort of look backwards and then look at our current moment. So we, we in April, uh, had a two-part symposium uh, here at the Addison that answered uh, those questions. So this talk is sort of adapted from a, um, a much shorter talk that I gave um, as part of the symposium. But that's that opportunity, that invitation really allowed us to look critically, as we've, we've always done, but look critically anew in our current moment at the Addison's collection, at how the Addison constructs American identity, how the Addison defines who is or is not an American artist. Uh, of course, again, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'll I'll go back to our founder, Thomas Cochran. Uh, he uh, was a member of the Phillips Academy class of, of 1890. He uh, was originally from uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. His family uh, was, was fairly affluent, but by the time he had matriculated to Phillips Academy, his family had really started to fall on hard times. Uh, he had quite a... Um, a sense of humor. He was quite a colorful uh, personality. He was a he rose to to fame as a banker, and we don't necessarily associate bankers with great personalities and great senses of humor. But he uh, was the was the exception to the rule. Uh, we know this because his hijinks were pretty well documented. While he was here at Andover, he uh, ran into uh, it, again. I should mention it wasn't really hard to get in trouble at Andover. Up until maybe the 1970s, you would get demerits for walking on the grass, for example. So, you know, when you say got in trouble, there's a, a pretty broad spectrum of, of trouble that you could get in that would would still lead to major headaches, disciplinarily speaking. Uh, but we know that he was accused at various times of frequenting bordellos. Um, he uh, was a prankster when he went to Yale after graduating Phillips Academy, which was the common uh, path. If you were a real rebel, you would go to Harvard. Uh, but you know, if you were, uh, if you wanted to be the perfect Andover man, you would go from Andover to Yale. And uh, he went to Yale, following in the footsteps of many generations of Andover students before him. While he was at Yale, he was in Skull and Bones. He was, um, you know, quite popular. He also had to pay his way through college. Uh, his family, as I mentioned, was starting to fall on hard times, but had completely gone bankrupt by the time that he went to Yale. And he actually spent a lot of his undergraduate years working to repay his, his father's debts and also to pay his way through school. So he is sort of this um, canonical uh, American boot, pick your, you know, lift yourself up by your bootstraps uh, type story. Um, he um, also, um, there's a in his 1936 obituary, the New York Times talks about this really memorable episode where he stole a cast iron dog from a professor's residence, took it uh, to the one of the belfries at um, at at Yale and bolted it to the belfry. That was uh, notable enough to make it into his New York Times um, dec uh, his obituary, and it was said that he did this because it had uh, he it had incurred his aesthetic displeasure, and he described it as a monstrosity in garden decoration. So even though he went into the field of banking, he had a, a, an, an interest in aesthetics and art, even though this was not one that he explored professionally or even as a serious art collector until he got it in his mind to form the Addison. Um, he was also um, quite a visionary. He uh, joined the board of trustees um, at Phillips Academy in 1923. Uh, he was made partner at uh, J.P. Morgan uh, a few years prior to that. Um, I He also, I should mention, after he graduated from Yale, was fairly well known as a college football coach. He went back to Minnesota and co coached the football team at the University of uh, Minnesota and went on speaking engagements to raise funds for the, the program. So he became fairly well known as a college football a coach before he turned uh, his career over to finances and was a very well-regarded and important financial figure in New York City, uh, so much so that there's an, uh, quite a funny anecdote. He was about to board a ship, 
someone at a reporter asked him, what are your thoughts on the stock market? He said, I think the Ford Ford stock should be trading three times higher. And by the time he made it to to London, the stock price of, of Ford had tripled. So he was capable um, of really turning the market. He was extraordinarily influential. Not as an art collector, though. Um, the Addison factor was really one, just one part. It's it's really the crowning achievement of his philanthropic endeavors, but it's just one part of his ma major philanthropic effort here at Phillips Academy. He, with uh, his friend, the architect Charles Platt, really completely redesigned campus. He would uh, have buildings moved. Um, he would have buildings rotated. He attempted to reroute uh, the highway um, to avoid Andover. Uh, he built the bird sanctuary. He built the chapel. He built the main administrative building. He built the library. So the Addison is but one of, of a whole constellation of major philanthropic uh, endeavors here at Phillips Academy. Uh, but his whole belief was that Phillips Academy had transformed his life fundamentally, and he wanted to ensure that generations of, at the time, young men, uh, would benefit from a Phillips Academy education. And he also believed, why should the students of Phillips Academy not be surrounded by the best of the best? Uh, that extended to music, through our chapel, uh, he and, you know, he want, and the very expensive organ he put in, he, you know, why should they not be surrounded by natural beauty? He put in a bird sanctuary. And he also thought, why should they not be surrounded by the best of art? And that comes to the very first work that uh, was purchased for the Addison, or what would become the Addison's collection. And I should mention that the Addison did not exist even on paper until 1930. So what we're talking about with this core collection is a group of uh, 58 works that Thomas Cochran and his close associates donated to Phillips Academy in 1928 in honor of Phillips Academy's 150th anniversary. These paintings, and, and I'll show you more images of these installed, were first displayed in the trustee's office or boardroom, rather, here at uh, Andover. And then it became very clear uh, thereafter that a permanent house needed to be, or permanent residence for these paintings needed to be constructed. But we started off on a very high note with the very first work acquired, and that is uh, Winslow Homer's West Wind from 1891. And this is really the centerpiece of the exhibition and really the cornerstone of our collection. Uh, he was not, as I mentioned, known as an art collector, but he was in a certain upper class, uh, very learned, uh, moneyed milieu in, in New York. He was very close with the sister-in-law of Lily Bliss. And Lily Bliss would be one of the core members of the Addison's founding art committee, which I'll get into a little bit later. She was also one of the founders of the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, the Addison and the Museum of Modern Art and the Whitney all emerged out of the same sort of cultural moment in the late 1920s, early 1930s, and shared uh, many of the same founders, uh, or, you know, were, were sort of in the same orbit. Uh, and even though we don't necessarily think of Andover and the Addison in the same category necessarily as MoMA, uh, in those days, we were really uh, considered sort of um, brother and sister organizations, particularly with the Whitney, which was really focusing on the art of 20th century where the Addison was looking uh, at the at the past. Um, and, and those two collections really complemented each other. Uh, so the West Wind uh, was acquired by Thomas Cochran in 1927. He actually went to the home uh, of uh, Samuel Untermeyer, the great New York City uh, magnate and philanthropist, went to his Yonkers estate, Greystone, where this painting was very prominently displayed. And he made Mr. Untermeyer a, a, a deal that he could not refuse. And that was to pay uh, something around the sum of, of $40,000 for this one painting. And when this was acquired, it would really set the tone for the level of quality that would be expected out of subsequent acquisitions. Uh, it is a masterpiece of American maritime painting, a, a, a symphony in, in browns, which is not necessarily a sentence that comes very often in, in art history. We don't necessarily associate brown as a, or we don't see brown as a very seductive or uh, aesthetically appealing color. And there's actually this great, perhaps totally apocryphal um, story that Winslow Homer uh, was in a sort of... Um, uh, 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 he made a, a bet with John Lafarge, one of his colleagues, that the first, you know, if they, if either one of them could um, paint a, a picture in mostly shades of brown that would be deemed successful, they would win this bet. And this was allegedly, I can't, I don't want to make it seem as though I'm promoting this false story, but it's a great one if it's true. Um, Winslow Homer uh, presented this as his answer to this bet uh, and, and won. Um, and you, 
you really need to experience this painting in person um, to understand the power of brushstroke, of color, of tone. And then this really brilliant way that Winslow Homer integrates the color red into the composition. In the lower left, you can sort of see, although it's a much more, it's a much brighter red in person, how he's how he's disguising his own signature as, as a bramble or a twig in this amazing uh, windswept la landscape, which is at Prout's Neck, his his home, uh, the the area where his his home and studio in Maine was located. So um, Thomas Cochran was not going at this alone. He he really benefited from the advice of his of his friends who were experienced art collectors, uh, but maybe a, more than anyone, he benefited uh, from the uh, advice of Robert McIntyre. And Robert McIntyre was the principal of Macbeth Gallery. Um, and you can actually see him in this John Sloan etching from 1911. He's the man standing next to the painting on the easel um, and making, you know, it's a high pressure sales situation where this man uh, is staring at his painting. They're trying to make a sale. Uh, McIntyre was uh, a, a very well-known gallerist. Macbeth Gallery was established in 1892 by a Scotch-Irish immigrant, William Macbeth, who was uh, was the uh, uncle of, of uh, Robert McIntyre. And Macbeth Gallery was notable because at a time when American art was not collectible, it was not respected, um, all of the great, you know, the the High, the the upper echelon of New York society, they were not buying American paintings um, at the turn of the 20th century. They were buying uh, old masters. They were, if they were, you know, really uh, avant-garde, they were buying Impressionism. Uh, Macbeth saw a, a, a real hole in the market and wanted to create a, a gallery in which, quote, the work of American artists um, could be uh, Sorry, I meant, sorry, he stated that the work of American artist Macbeth, the founder of the gallery, has never received the full share of appreciation that it deserves. And the time has come when an effort should be made to gain for it the favor of those who have hitherto purchased foreign pictures exclusively. Uh, and he wanted to make his this establishment known as the place where maybe procured the very best our artists can produce. So this very nationalistic patriotic mission, the gallery itself by the 1930s was quite conservative, but was known primarily for uh, uh, a show that they had mounted uh, in 1908, which was a show of the, a radical show at that time of the eight, which was um, later would morph into the Ashcan school. So these are artists who were protesting the, the, the very academic rigorous standards of the National Academy of Design. These were artists like uh, George Bellows and Robert Henry, many of whom started off as newspaper illustrators, were really interested in uh, the lower classes and and engaging with the, the 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 populace that could be found on the streets and immigrant neighborhoods. They they painted pictures that were not um, on their surface pleasing or beautiful in a conventional sense. They were very gritty, very raw. Uh, and Macbeth Gallery really championed those artists at an early period. But by the 1930s, when when uh, Cochrane was working with Macbeth to grow what would become the Addison's collection, they had become fairly conservative in their taste. And they had a stable of artists uh, who were uh, you know, accepted by the uh, art collecting class. They were critically uh, uh, acclaimed, uh, but as I mentioned, quite conservative. Um, and they were, as a gallery, very suspicious of modernism. Um, this is this figure, Royal Cortizo, was one of the most important figures in the early 20th century uh, in in New York and in within the world of American art. He was the longtime uh, uh, art critic for the New York Herald Tribune. He worked from 1891 until 1948 as the critic, so half a century of of really being the arbiter of American art of of taste in America. Uh, he was born to immigrants, um, but he himself harbored vehemently anti-immigrant uh, uh, points of view. He, um, in, in a 1923 American art essay uh, called Ellis Island Art, he discusses that the United States is invaded by aliens, thousands of whom constitute so many acute perils to the health of the body politic. Uh, he is, goes on to associate modernism with immigrants. Um, he goes on to say that um, these movements, um, things like uh, cubism, um, uh, abstraction, these movements have been promoted by types not yet fitted for their papers, first papers and aesthetic naturalization. 
the makers of true Ellis Island art. So this conflation of immigrants uh, with with modernism and this association of uh, with with modernism as a corrupting influence on American art and culture is something that Royal Cortiso really promoted. And he, as it's relevant to our story, was consulted very early on in this uh, mission to build the Addison's collection by McIntyre. There's actually um, this incredible uh, document that survives where um, Royal Cortiso was invited by McIntyre to respond to this list, which we have on, on the right side of your screen, of artists both deceased and living that were being considered for inclusion in the Addison's collection. Uh, this was very much an, an effort to kiss the ring and sort of get this institutional buy-in for what was what was happening in Andover, which was very unprecedented at the time. If you think, if you look back and think that, you know, the very first dedicated mainstream American art gallery emerges in the late 19th century, there were really um, very few museums dedicated explicitly to American art at this time. American art was seen largely as European pastiche, um, and and the influence that influences of of European art were seen as deleterious, as as things that sort of um, prevented America from coming out under under its kind of um, subservient role of emerging from this colonial mindset of being this 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 um, sort of backwater offshoot of this colony of this great cultural and political power, the United Kingdom. Uh, and um, this effort to really make for America this this usable pass for to establish what makes you America unique. So this list was provided to Royal Cortizo, and um, he he wrote back with with some really funny, um, at, at some very prescient and some very accurate, but some others uh, quite quite humorous uh, responses to some of the artists proposed. On uh, Ralph Albert Blakelock, who uh, is now one of regarded as one of the most important uh, late 19th, early 20th century American painters. He said, I'm dubious about him. His style is stenciled and artificial. The particular note of the American landscape school and its fresh, unspoiled character. All the natural juices are squeezed out of Blakelock. He may last, but I doubt it. About Maurice Prendergast. Yes, if a good example is available, get it. But no hurry about him. Interesting, but not very important. About Walt Kuhn, he said, I can't for the life of me see why. Dreadful stuff. He did encourage the acquisition of works by Mary Cassatt, William Merritt Chase, uh, Mariah Oki Dewing, and Ryder. Um, but then there are many whose names, by artists whose names have been completely lost to time. People like W. Gedney Bunce, George Fuller, Charles Webster Hawthorne, who is better known if you are if you know about um, Provincetown, Eugene Higgins, and Van Deering Perrine. Uh, these, are, these are very conservative artists who uh, were, were quite widely accepted. It, it does... It is noteworthy to mention that it the that the uh, that Charles Sawyer, who was the first curator of the Addison, claims that Cortisot's opinions were not um, taken into account by the art committee. But I, I do find that a little bit hard to believe um, that they weren't aware of of his feedback and opinions. So um, Cochran was building this collection, working with McIntyre, and they started to think, you know, how do you define at this point, they weren't thinking of a museum. That may have been in the back of their mind, but they were thinking of a, a, a strong collection for Phillips Academy. Where do you start? If you're, you know, where do you go from Winslow Homer? Um, do you try to backfill? Do you look at European precedents? Uh, are you looking at uh, art on a more global scale, which was certainly not their concern? They, I think the biggest uh, debate was whether or not to collect European art or just focus on American art. This is a, and I don't expect you to read this, um, but this is a uh, an excerpt from an es essay that was written by McIntyre for the Phillips Bulletin, which is the uh, which was the um, sort of the alumni magazine that was put out by Phillips Academy. And you start to think, even though they're saying that they're not explicitly influenced by Royal Cortiso, you can really get a sense of the environment from which this collection was established. This was a, you know, this this school is perceived uh, and was at the time this sort of bastion of white elite elitism. And they were keenly aware of the fact that this was an organization that was seen as distinctly American. And for that institution, why should they not pre pro uh, provide them with this distinctly American collection? There's um, in this essay, which is is really interesting to read, um, almost proto-fascist, which I'll get to. It, it sounds a bit like a Mussolini speech. Uh, 
McIntyre talks about they're facing this problem. Do they want to um, create a, a purely American collection or should there be a heterogeneous group of pictures by both foreign and American object uh, artists? He then says, patriotism and a just pride answered this question. For is not Phillips Academy an American institution, the oldest preparatory school in the country, founded upon American ideals, implanting them, furthering and promoting them through the education of its youth? It was at that point that they decided that uh, the collect its collection of pictures, insofar as those responsible for its development were concerned, should represent all that is best in American painting, not only of past generations, but of the present one as well and should aim to inculcate in the hearts of the students a reverent respect for the noble heritage handed down to us from our early progenitors in art, to inspire them with the creative ability of our artists and their high ideals, in short, to bring them to a realization of the integrity and independence of our native school of painting. That use of native is, is interesting. And to enlighten them with its early beginnings, its one-time submergence under European influences, its slow recovery from these, its later development, and its present full-fledged and glorious freedom. What a prospect for aesthetic culture. What an outlook for the future appreciation of American art. So there's this very bombastic um, uh, essay published. Um, Matt, uh, Cochran never wrote about his, um, his desire for the Addison, um, other than the terms of trust, which I'll get to uh, later on. So he never really articulated this, uh, this. This he appointed McIntyre to be sort of his spokesperson. So even though Cochrane isn't writing these words himself, there's no way that this would have been published without Cochrane's blessing. So McIntyre is really articulating the program, the ideological program that was undergirding the, the uh, accumulation of works for Phillips Academy. So then we think about what were these works? So we go back to the exhibition. Uh, you're greeted by this uh, bust of, of our founder, Thomas Cochran, which doesn't uh, necessarily see the light of day, perhaps for good reason, very often. But if we're going to bring it out, we're going to bring it out for this for this show. Uh, it was done by Paul Manship, who uh, had a very important relationship with Phillips Academy through Charles Platt, who was the architect responsible for the Addison and many other academic buildings uh, and administrative buildings on campus and for the general uh, plan of the of the campus. Um, Manship. Uh, is well represented, not just at the Addison, but on Phillips Academy's campus. There's a mate, really one of the few works of, of public art or sculpture at, uh, on campus is his armillary sphere. Uh, we are, you're greeted as you enter the Addison by his uh, Venus fountain. So uh, Manship was one of the kind of core artists in our collection, one of the most important living artists uh, at the time of the Addison's opening in, represented in our collection. So this show um, looks at the 58 works that Cochran and his associates accumulated. I should also mention his associates. He um, in, he worked primarily with uh, Charles Platt, who was the architect, McIntyre, the gallerist, Lily Bliss, who was uh, uh, a, an art a patron and, and collector, her sister-in-law, uh, Zadie Cobb Bliss, uh, who was really the closest personally to Cochran, a very, very dear friend. The Addison is actually named after her mother, um, her mother was um, named Katora Addison uh, Cobb, um, and uh, this this museum was named in her honor. He was also, as I mentioned, Cochran was a very savvy businessman, and he knew that in any alphabetical listing, the Addison of museums, the Addison would be up toward the top, which it still is. The one time that we we are uh, uh, bumped from the top is when the Ackland Museum lands, but AD is a pretty good spot to be when you're when you're dealing with alphabetical ordering. So laying the foundation, exploring the nucleus of the Addison's collection um, is not uh, laid out in any sort of um, prescribed way. There are suggestions of groupings, but this is a very e eclectic, as was mentioned earlier, collection. And it was not necessarily formed um, with the, the direct uh, purpose of being truly the nucleus for um, a larger museum collection. That would come and they would fill in the gaps between 1928 and 1931 when the museum opened to the public. But this um, this collection is deeply personal. It really, I would say, reflects um, the the eccentricities, the pers the differences, the particularities of the people that, that built it. So largely Cochrane and McIntyre, but you also see works like this, um, Arthur Bowen Davies, that kicks off the exhibition donated by Lizzie Bliss. You have works donated by uh, by really all of the primary members of the of what was what was to become the core art committee, this advisory board uh, that governed the Addison. 
Um, so we start on the wall on the wall with Arthur Bowen Davies, who is a, a really interesting case study. If you were to look at the Addison's collect founding collection, uh, Arthur Bowen Davies is is by far the most uh, uh, represented artist in this group of fifty eight works. Um, Lizzie Bliss gave uh, Mountain Beloved of Spring, which was one of his um, uh, better known works. Surprise, believe it or not, um, it, it's a fairly unremarkable uh, mountainscape. Bowen Davies is a fascinating character. He was incredibly influential, had very advanced and, and avant-garde taste, but he himself in his artistic production was fairly conservative. He's known primarily for his mythological scenes, his his um, often in these arca figures in these Arcadian landscapes, drawing from Greek mythology in many cases. Um, and he was prolific. There is a lot of his work out there. And uh, he was very well positioned socially. And so he was very close with people like Lily Bliss, who collected his work in depth, and who then uh, seeded the collections of the institutions they founded with his work. So you'll find his work, really any museum that was founded in the 20s and 30s has a, a pretty strong uh, Davies uh, uh, presence in its collection. Uh, he was also one of the organizers of the 1913 Armory Show. So he had the respect of, of the avant-garde artist, even though he himself he was put in this very uneasily put in the the sort of uh, uh, under the the heading of of uh, the Ashcan school. But his work, again, landscapes, uh, very pure landscapes, often mythological in tone, did not um, did not really uh, correspond with the very contemporary, gritty, um, uh, socially engaged aims of the Ashcan school. Uh, so he occupies this very delicate position, and he's certainly one who's Ha, whose reputation has diminished in the years since his passing. I'll also mention uh, when he died, it was discovered um, that he had two separate families that didn't know of each other. He was married to a woman, had children. He also had a common law wife. The two families did not know each other out until after his death. Very colorful figure. Unfortunately, his art is not particularly well regarded in this current moment. Um, it's certainly worthy of attention and study. Um, but what the other thing that's great about this show is it it goes to show that uh, reputations are not stable. Um, they were ex they were spending large sums of money on artists um, whose work has appreciated uh, in in value by a magnitude of you know many many times. Some of the artists though did not survive the test of time, and that's not to say that they will not twenty thirty forty years from now, hundred years from now, be viewed as we continually redefine the American canon will not be viewed more favorably. Uh, that's not that's not to say nothing is permanent. And that's why it, it's it's very dangerous to to deaccession or or thin the collection based on taste alone because tastes change. There are a number of artists today whose work fifty years ago would not have been shown, uh, but they're you know very very coveted works and command huge values. Um, so that's important to notice that there's there are great very pressing acquisitions in this group of 58 works and then there are some duds by today's standards and and Arthur Bowen Davies is someone who is not um really uh, uh who, who has not maintained the level of fame and critical attention you could not have an American art collection with our without Davies in in the in the 1920s and 30s he was such a powerful force but times change tastes change and the show really demonstrates that you know our understanding of American art is ever, ever changing and evolving. So we have this one wall that the introductory wall, if you were to ask what was the state of American art in 1928 and looked at our collection, you would think Arthur Bowen Davies was the state of American art, which he was in many respects. So I wanted to to not hide that fact, but to to highlight that certain artists were, were perhaps over collected in the early years of the Addison's history. So as I mentioned, there's no kind of coherent grouping. We go around the corner from this group of works by Arthur Bowen Davies from the early 20th century into this work by Tr Charles Prendergast, uh, who is one of the few living artists in the court collection. He he uh, uh, had a very longstanding relationship with the Addison. The Addison was actually the first New England institution to uh, give a retrospective to Maurice, his more famous uh, brother, and Charles Prendergast. And he remembered that for his life uh, during his lifetime and his widow uh, remembered that fact. And we benefited uh, from from their generosity uh, and have one of the more comprehensive collections of Prendergast Brothers art in, in the world. 
Um, Maurice is next to Charles Prendergast. I'm going left to right, those two watercolors. Then we have a John Singer Sargent in the middle. Uh, we have a George Bellows stacked up high. This is a Monhegan picture. Uh, then we have uh, uh, um, a picture by Twachman called The Inlet, and then Whistler on the end. These images broadly are about travel. They're about um, uh, ex American artists abroad. Sargent, of course, was a uh, was uh, was born in Italy and lived most of his life outside of the United States. Whistler, born in Lowell, Massachusetts, but lived most of his life and and his entire career was spent uh, largely in London and Paris. Um, so we have uh, these artists engaging, American artists engaging with the world of 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 outside of the United States and also the world of fantasy, particularly with the work of of Charles Prendergast. On that wall, the sort of undisputed, most important, not that we think of it that way, but the 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 sort of key work on that wall is this piece by uh, James McNeil Whistler called Brown and Silver Old Battersea Bridge, which was an incredible prize when the Addison acquired it um, or sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, when when Phillips Academy acquired it in 1928. It was a gift of Cornelius Bliss, the husband of Zadie Claude, uh, Cobb Bliss, Cochran's dear friend. And it was Whistler's first significant commission. He at this time was a very young, he was in his 20s, in, uh, struggling artist, living in London. He had gone to London to work on a suite of, of etchings, were not they were not particularly successful. He was having a hard time paying the bills and he sought commission work. Um, Alexander Ioannidis, who was the first uh, owner of this work, was one of the, uh, who was a Greek shipping magnate and one of the commissioners of the Crystal Palace. And you can actually see the famed Paxton design Crystal Palace. In the background, if you look very closely, you can see this kind of largely rectangular structure with a little uh, a dome on the top and the far back of this scene, and that's the Crystal Palace. So there's a sort of an autobiographical component, um, or, you know, he was currying favor with his uh, uh, patron. But it's um, one of his early uh, works in London. He's developing what would become his signature style of these wash, these light washes, very atmospheric washes of color, um, very abstract. Um, to think that this was made at the same time as the, as the American Civil War, and you look at work that was produced in the American Civil War, there's nothing really like this being made in the United States. He was so far ahead in so many ways aesthetically. Um, it's also interesting to note when you come to the show, if you've been, this feels the most, this painting, even though it's it's actually one of, if not the oldest paintings in the core collection, feels the most contemporary. He was an incredible force pave the way for abstraction, pave the way uh, for uh, modernism. Um, and this is a key early work uh, by one of America's um, most important uh, expatriate artists. There's a funny uh, bit about this. Whistler was so broke when he made this work that he actually recycled, uh, painted over a recycled canvas. So there was an x-ray done and this, uh, it was revealed that he painted over a, a self-portrait. So there is, uh, a Whistler self-portrait under the surface of uh, Old Battersea Bridge. But I think you can tell, even though I think we got the better end of the, the deal, it's it's probably not not a bad thing that he painted over. It's not a horrible portrait, but um, he's he was certainly moving in a, in a much stronger direction with with our painting. So then you turn the corner and you're you're treated. And, and I should mention, this is the view that you would have as you walk into the exhibition. So you see Cochrane and his, you know, beautiful uh, bulbous nose on the left hand side you see another uh, uh, work um, um, uh, by Manship on the right and then you have this expanse of landscape paintings on the the far left we have a work by Twachman one of the most important uh, American impressionists Wyant then Blakelock Homer Innes Ryder uh, and then uh, uh, Homer Dodge Martin who is a, another character that most people have not heard of, but was very, very popular. Uh, and, and his work was extraordinarily valuable at that time. So I'm just going to talk about some of the general trends that um, unite uh, a lot of, or characterize a lot of these early acquisitions, particularly uh, within the realm of landscape. So there are a number of landscapes um, in this core collection. I should also mention that even though Cochrane was really operating with a blank checkbook, there was no expense was was spared. He, you know, he was willing to put his money down on the line and pay really whatever was needed to acquire the best. But he was at the mercy of the market. 
And this is what was coming, um, even though Untermeyer, you know, that's one anecdote that's, uh, you know, that he went in and had this painting in mind and made an offer that he couldn't refuse. That was not always the case. And he was really dependent on what was coming up in the market. And he was also, because McIntyre was working with him, uh, a lot of this work was uh, in the core collection. Unsurprisingly, it was work that was handled by Macbeth Gallery. So uh, on the ethical mor morality side of things, McIntyre was getting commissions often on both ends. He was making out like a bandit. Macbeth Gallery made out like a bandit. Uh, and they really shaped, Macbeth Gallery really shaped the, the tenor, the tone of this core collection. And because of that, the core collection skews, for the most part, uh, conservative, there's a lot of, uh, most of the works it was created during uh, a span of time from the late 19th century into the first uh, two decades. There's really nothing beyond the early 1920s in this core collection. And they tended toward the romantic. There's a lot of late Victorian romantic landscapes in the collection. For example, we still do not have a significant large format Hudson River School painting, which people are surprised to hear. So, um, because of the, you know, these were these were things that were, this is what was available to purchase um, and also what was available uh, through Macbeth to purchase. So we have Alexander Wyant, great sort of Barbizon inspired late um, uh, 19th century uh, landscape painter, George Innes, who's represented uh, uh, very well in our, in our collection. You also have some of the outliers. As I mentioned, I like to see, a, think of this, this founding of, of the Addison and, and this core collection as, as a, kind of the American art history in real time. So McIntyre, Cochrane, they were not necessarily cognizant of this, but they were making a statement as to who was and who wasn't considered to be, you know, at the top of the American art hierarchy, who was deserving of inclusion in this, in this, uh, in this collection. And as I mentioned, there was this great paranoia about European influence. So a lot of times these, the Americanness of an artist became very, very important. Um, the, the artists who stood apart from European uh, predecessors, the artists who were just quote unquote distinctly American. And these are two of the most distinctly American idiosyncratic artists of their time, Ralph uh, Blakelock on the left and Albert Pinkham Ryder on the right, who by the 1930s were seen, uh, were perceived of as the most important, among the most important 19th and early 20th century painters. And they were hugely, hugely um, uh, inspirational to subsequent generations. Mars and Harley, for example, was profoundly influenced by Ryder. Uh, and, you know, so these were very important artists uh, uh, in their time. And then uh, at the time, their their reputations were, all, were, were ascendant uh, through the 1930s. Both uh, had fascinating stories. Blakelock was uh, suffered from mental illness. He had large a large family that he couldn't support. At one point, he was institutionalized. Uh, or he, at one point, he was institutionalized for the last two decades of his life, and and quite tragically, um, he was he was sort of a he was a, a struggling artist before he was institutionalized. As he was institutionalized, his work uh, became inc increasingly popular. He started to be collected by major institutions. He was commanding huge sums of money for his work. I said he was not involved. Unfortunately, uh, he was not reaping, he was not benefiting from this uh, really at all. And he would tell the people that uh, were institutionalizing him that he was this famous artist, but they thought that that was a symptom of his mental illness and didn't believe that he was a famous artist. Um, he was later taken advantage of by this, uh, this horrible woman who ended up stealing all of his money. Very tragic story. Uh, Ryder, on the other hand, also fascinating backstory, was known for his experimentation, which has also rendered many of his paintings completely illegible. Both artists, I should mention, were also two of the most frequently, according to Lloyd Goodrich, were two of the most frequently uh, copied artists of the 19th century. And so when you're dealing with both artists, Blakelock and Ryder, provenance uh, becomes very important because there are many times more fake Blakelocks and writers than there are legitimate Blakelocks and writers because their style was so distinctive that uh, forgers had a field day copying their style. Uh, Ryder also used a lot of very unconventional materials. He would suspend things like um, uh, different oils. He would um, wax. He would mix his 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 paints with wax. Um, in many cases, that cause the 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 canvases to darken over time, and some are completely illegible. Some have d disintegrated completely. 
the Blake lock that we have is very legitimate. Is a very legitimate Blake lock with with great provenance. We have four quote unquote four riders um, in our collection. I've included this because it's been dismissed by by Lloyd Goodrich in the forties was dismissed as a as a copy, but it has really important provenance. It was um, a gift of Lily Bliss. Lily Bliss was very good. It was a very savvy collector, was very good friends with Arthur Bone Davies, who in turn was a very good friend of Ryder. It seems to me, at least, very unlikely that Bliss would have uh, been in the position to acquire a fake Ryder. Um, but this has been deemed uh, most likely if this was deemed 80 years ago and, and nobody wants to revisit it, it's, it's um, attribution. But out of our four uh, Ryders, I would say this is the most um, the most. Uh, convincingly writer of the group um but we we acknowledge that there is some debate so we do uh, treat it as an attributed work so you turn the corner from these romantic very moody brooding landscapes into this world of of women and children um this is where we can kind of get a little freudian and a little autobiographical with the read on this in this collection and thinking about what does this say about the people who gave this work or in in this case the person thomas cochran here we have Bellows on the, the far left, um, Aikens, Dewing, and then uh, another Homer. Um, uh, we know that um, Cochran uh, was married. His wife, unfortunately, passed away in the 19 teens. He never remarried. He never had children. I think that uh, I think if he had had children, he wouldn't have thrown himself necessarily as passionately and, and in such an all consuming way into his philanthropic works. Um, but because he had no heirs, direct heirs, he did know, I, I think, that this that his philanthropic legacy at Andover and the other places that he supported would be his legacy broadly. Also, what's notable is that he did all of this anonymously. So I, we've looked at a number of credit lines. If you've been looking at the credit lines and the captions, they'll say anonymous donor. Cochran was the anonymous donor. It was not really a great secret then and certainly not a secret now. Uh, but he never put his own name on the projects that he funded uh, here at the Addison, or sorry, at Phillips Academy. We do know that he had a very nationalist, patriotic bent. To him, he he wanted his buildings to be named after famous Americans. We have a George Washington Hall, Revere, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, for example. So he was very interested, even though he we don't have explicit documentation, interested in this uh, 19th century or 20th century white upper, you know, upper echelon conception of what made America uh, distinct and important, and, and and that was its history, and wanting to to really uh, celebrate and highlight its history. Um, we also know uh, that he collected or collected for the Ad what would become the Addison a number of works that depict women and children, um, and perhaps that could be uh, a, a, a testament to his own uh, grief surrounding the loss of his wife and and the lack of of uh, of children in in his own life. Uh, there are a number of, of portraits in the collection, core collection by artists like George Bellows and in a purple wrap from 1921, Thomas Aikens, Elizabeth at the piano, really beautiful uh, uh, depictions of, uh, of women, primarily in domestic surroundings. We then turn the corner and we get to this wall that I've, I've sort of um, dedicated to, to fishing and, and uh, sporting. Uh, it should all, it, it's unsurprising as well that Cochran, he was a uh, uh, an outdoorsman. He was uh, an angler, very, very interested in um, in in fishing and the depiction of fishing and art. So there's a lot. There are a number of sporting pictures in the core collection. Uh, on the left, you have this wonderful uh, Winslow Homer watercolor uh, of of a fly fisherman called Casting. We have Frank Weston Benson's on the Restigouche, which is a a, a river in Canada that was uh, qu a, quite a popular destination for uh for sportsmen like uh Thomas Cochran. So there's this autobiographical component that is interesting to to sort of tease out from this core collection. So, you have 58 paintings, where do you put them? Uh, they a selection was first installed in the trustees room in George Washington Hall, which was a building that uh Cochran paid for. Uh, uh for the 150th anniversary of the Academy. So they were installed in honor of this anniversary. And then it became very clear thereafter that a more permanent spot needed to be found for the Addison's collection. It was at one point installed in the upper floor of Oliver Wendell Holmes Library, but it could never be shown in full. It was uh, 
it was determined quite early on that um, something more permanent had to happen. So that's why you have in 1930, the drafting of the Terms of Trust, trust which is a document that we, uh, that's our governing document. It's, we we still operate under this core founding document. Um, and he describes, this is, and this is also the clearest uh, articulation of Cochrane's uh, ideology, his mission for creating this art museum, which was unprecedented. Um, it was rare enough to have a, a university with an art museum. There, we are the only quote unquote high school art museum of of, of great significance. And uh, he was doing something totally unique. It was also very unique for him, again, to focus on American art. It was not popular. Uh, it was not uh, particularly uh, valuable at that time. So he was he was quite a visionary in that regard. So we have him articulating his terms of trust and his terms of trust that his effort to build an art gallery was, you know, it's bent on a desire to per enrich permanently the lives of the students of Phillips Academy by helping to cultivate and foster in them a love for the beautiful and a love for the beautiful as the guiding principle uh, of, of the gallery uh, is, is, is quite, um, is, is a, is a, is a very high bar and it's one that we, we always have in mind. And I think it's very easy to dismiss the beautiful, particularly in our climate, uh, our current climate, um, where you know everything is is politicized, um, that that beauty seemingly doesn't have a, a have a role, or might be perceived as not as not having a role. But we find ourselves constantly grappling with or, or attempting to strike a balance, and and that balance is something that that we we strive for at the Addison: a balance between, of course, thought provoking work, but also strong aesthetic, you know, aesthetically strong works of art. The the uh, the document is 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 really pretty fascinating to 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 look through and um it he was he was very savvy so he um he had already spent millions of dollars on on building this collect or had started to spend millions of dollars to build the collection itself he pledged a, a further 1.5 thereabouts million dollars um to endow the to endow the addison which was key uh the Addison is is a department of Phillips Academy. We are part of we are we do not exist apart from Phillips Academy, but we are endowed separately. Our endowments are commingled, but it is separate. And I think that has allowed the Addison to grow um, at at the speed that it that it did, and and for us to be as uh, you know to punch above our weight, which we we strive to. So uh, he was very savvy in separately endowing the Addison because you know high. High schools are certainly not in the museum running business, so he he understood that in order to to uh, ensure the long term survival of of his creation, that it was important to put his money uh, where his mouth is and ensure the long time the long term uh, con uh, continuity of the Addison. He also put a very important stipulation on what could be collected. We can show uh, any work by, you know, an art, any artist that we want to. And, and particularly in the early days, there were a lot of shows by non-American artists. But um, it's very explicitly stated that for work to be accessioned, purchased, donated, put permanently into the Addison's collection, the maker has to have been either a native born or naturalized citizen of the United States. Um, there are some loopholes. There's a loophole with model ships, which is why we have a Yinka Shonabari uh, ship in our collection. There are other loopholes for photography and books, it was largely because uh, photography especially was not seen uh, in the 1930s as a fine art. So he was probably referring more to documentation um, or uh, you know art historical um, photographs that might be used in classes. Um, so there are these loopholes, but he was very uh, firm in his... Um, in his definition of what is America and what is American art, that it is dependent on citizenship. There is a lot that could be said about, you know, who uh, in the night, who was eligible for citizenship in 1930 when this was drafted. And that was, you know, um, there was a large swath of the population that was not eligible, particularly people from Asian countries uh, who were excluded from, from gaining U.S. citizenship. So this is, again, citizenship is ever evolving. Uh, and uh, and and is not fixed. Um, we continue to redefine America every day, uh, and and his understanding of of what was America in 1930 is is quite different from our own uh, today. And he's really seeking to uphold this noble heritage. And this is a a noble heritage that again we have to think critically of. Is this a noble heritage of all? He certainly did not, and the founders of the Addison in the 1930s did not have this sort of nuance. Uh, 
nuanced views that uh, are espoused today, looking at you know wide variety of of sources and and folding you know artists from from outside of the sort of white uh, 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 upper class uh, milieu into histories of American art. It was a much uh, it was a much less nuanced uh, definition of American art uh, at that time. But it's it's important to to think about and, and to situate in its in its moment. Um, he then went about in 1930. So from 1930, he drafts the terms of trust. The Addison opens the next year, and uh, the the Addison was constructed uh, in a in a fairly condensed period of time. Um, this is a a, a photograph um, recently digitized by New York Public Library that depicts the construction of the Addison, and you can see. Um, the uh, not the original, but a uh, a chapel that was on the site of what is now the Museum Learning Center, but was demolished as the Addison was being built. But in the earliest pic photographs of the Addison and up until the opening day of the Addison, you see this uh, high Gothic uh, revival um, chapel that was very much out of sync with the overall plan for Phillips Academy's architecture, which again, thinking of these are these are people who are very invested in in the America's past and, and upholding America's past and, and legacy. Um, Cochran and, and and his architect Platt ended up constructing buildings that were in the Georgian style. So uh you know a Georgian revival. So looking at the past in architectural American architectural history and updating it. So something like uh, a European Gothic inspired chapel was really out of step with this very American forward um, aesthetic plan for for the campus. Um, this is a this is a, a missing painting uh, by Child Hassam, who was uh, the famed American Impressionist, who was in our core collection. He was invited in the late uh, 1920s into 1930 to make pictures here at Andover, um, sort of a proto artist in residence, although it certainly was not understood as such in the time. And he made a painting, uh, several paintings. We have one of Pearson Hall. Uh, he made a number of paintings here at Phillips Academy. They were not, unfortunately, at the time deemed worthy enough uh, for to gain entry into the Addison's collection. And so the the painting that we do have of, of Andover's campus by Hassan came in, in the 1990s to our collection. There is this missing painting that would be wonderful to find, building the art museum, building the Addison. Uh, and over Massachusetts, where you do see this Gothic cathedral coexisting uh, very precariously next to the Addison structure. So, I've I've uh, I've rambled on and on. I'll, I'm wrapping it up. Um, so we've we've left off in 1930. So how did we get from the core collection to 1931? I should mention when the Addison opened its doors in 1931, the collection was numbered around 500 works. So it had grown from 58 to around 500 in, in the span of just a few years. There's a lot of inflation of that number caused through, you know, um, Charles Platt just donated his entire print archive to the Addison. So not 500 individual paintings, but um, they were working to really fill in the gaps. And this was, there's this great quote by Charles Sawyer, who was the inaugural curator of the Addison. He says that at a time when good American paintings were becoming scarce and prices steadily rising, Mr. Cochran and his associates had the courage to pay whatever whatever sums were necessary to inquire the best works available by those artists, uh, by each of the artists they chose to represent. In the course of, of three years, over a million dollars was spent in a collection which would rank with the best in its field was assured. Uh, one of the sort of the most important um, acquisition made in those in that brief period of time was the purchase of Winslow Homer's Eight Bells, which is the undisputed icon of the Addison's collection. We get angry letters if it's not on view. We don't have anything on permanent display, mind you. And that's always really been the case. And it, it helps us to remain nimble and fresh. But if we don't find a way to put Winslow Homer's eight bell somewhere on view, uh, we, we do actually get angry letters, particularly from older alumni. Uh, this made a splash when it was purchased in 1930. It was news that was carried in the New York Times and other uh, publications because this was the most expensive American painting ever sold up until that point. Cochran purchased it for uh, somewhere in the, the range of 60,000 US dollars in 1930. This is after the stock market crash. Uh, so that certainly made news that that there was this, uh, you know, well-known banker accumulating this major collection uh, for his prep school. And that uh, made a lot of uh, waves in, in the New York and larger art community. Uh, I just came across this really wonderful photograph. Um, 
Thomas Cochran bought all of this work, but didn't really get to live with it. it. He was not buying for himself. He was buying for the school and for his museum. But we, we do know that he did live with with some of his, these great masterpieces for some period of time. And so the, I found this wonderful photograph of his apartment um, in, in New York with eight bells hanging above his sofa in what appears to be his office. And then if you look really closely on his desk, you can see a small scale model of Manship's Venus Fountain. So he, he was he, he was clearly in the in the process of planning his museum and he had this preliminary maquette for what would be a major commissioned uh, sculpture um, that continues to grace our entryway. Some of the examples of work, they worked from 1928 to 1931 to fill in a lot of the gaps. So uh, as I mentioned, most of the work in the core collection is from the late 19th century. So they looked quite far back. They were requiring works by uh, artists uh, or, from the early colonial era. Um, Benjamin West is a curious um, artist because he left what we now know as the United States before 17, before the American Revolution, was a court painter in, in the court of uh, King George, well, is one of those artists who, who are technically American, but I don't really understand how you could make a, a great case other than this is the kind of portraiture that was being emulated by American artists. He was very, he was a very influential teacher of many American artists, but this portrait of um, essentially the British, British aristocratic brothers um, was acquired very early on to fill in these gaps. But again, the, when you're predicating the, you know, when you're claiming that this collection is meant to really convey what was unique and special about American artistic production, that's when it gets a little murky. He's also acquiring works like Thomas Aiken's masterpiece, Salutat, um, The Spielers by George Lukes. Here's the opening day of the Addison in May of 1931. And the uh, and this is how the Addison, uh, how the permanent collection of the Addison would have, what, some of the permanent collection would have appeared in the very early days. And you can pick out a number of recognizable works. I'll mention there's one work, or there are a few works actually, this George Luke's, which is, if you're looking at the long wall, the third in from the left, it's a boy playing a violin. That was deaccessioned um, when a more significant work by Luke's came in the collection. It's now in the Mets collection. And on its own wall between the, the two uh, portals into the sub galleries behind this gallery, in the center, you see this seascape. That's a Winslow Homer seascape called East Point that was deaccessioned uh, in the late 1940s, 1950s. Uh, it was sold and it, the proceeds from that uh, sale created an acquisition endowment for the Addison. Um, and it was sold because a work, another work by Winslow Homer, uh, Kissing the Moon, was acquired and it was deemed duplicative. And uh, so it was sold. It's now in the Clark's uh, collection out in Western Massachusetts. One final thought, um, we've, I've talked a lot about the conservative origins of the Addison's collection, and I, and I don't want to be mis, I don't want you to be misled, particularly if you've never visited. The Addison, even though we started with this very, or fairly conservative core collection, uh, very early on the seeds for what would become this very forward-looking avant-garde risk-taking institution were planted by Lily Bliss, Lizzie Bliss. Uh, who gave a number of her uh, American, a number of works from her collection of American art to the Addison. And I think uh, out of the core art committee was the one really pushing for greater contemporary representation in, in the early days of the Addison's collection uh, and collecting and, and exhibition program. Unfortunately, she died before the Addison opened. Uh, and we can only speculate as to how she would have shaped the Addison had she lived. Um, we benefit and we live in her legacy every day uh, from very... Uh, uh, prosaic ways, like you see this uh, great photo. She was a, well known as a collector of European modernism and her collection of European modernism was actually shown at the Addison before it was given to MoMA. Uh, and it caused uh, great uh, uh, controversy, it led to a lot of controversy, a lot of nasty op-eds. A lot of people thought it was disgusting. Uh, they found, you know, C Cezanne and, and Picasso and, and a, a number of the artists that she collected to be barbaric. Again, speaking to, you know, now those artists are so in institutional, they're, you know, they are the, at the core of modern art history. Uh, we don't react, we don't blanch in front of a, a Picasso painting, but again, it's all, uh, it's all historically situated. Um, but uh, back to her music room, which we have this great photo of, you see they're slip covered, but those couches are actually the couches that we use for gallery seating. Uh, and we have this large console table in our in storage. So she is she lives on at the Addison. And again, I mentioned that um, 
she she did donate some of uh, works by American artists in her collection. So um, contemporary art was collected really from the very beginning. And and the Addison, uh, Cochran died in 1936. It was, you know, he never, he was not in the five years that he uh, lived when the Addison was operating museum, was not overbearing, was not trying to dictate the programming of the institution, but he, he it was well understood what he envisioned the Addison uh, to be. And I think once he passed, uh, curator at the time, subsequent generations were were really free to make their own decisions. And so very early on, the Addison collected uh, works that were not popular, that uh, have, are now seen as these incredible pressing acquisitions, buying, you know, acquiring work by Jackson Pollock in 1950, buying, you know, Stuart, one of Stuart Davis's masterpieces for $500 in the 40s, things that were incredibly prescient that they were emboldened to do in the years following Cochrane's, um, Cochrane's death. So even though, you know, one of the mottos of Phillips Academy is, is the, you know, the, the ends are dependent on the beginning. And that's very true. But I would say that our beginning is not necessarily where we've ended up. It's certainly part of our history, but we've, we've expanded so far beyond this uh, core collection uh, of American, uh, of very conservative 19th century American art uh, to have a much more holistic uh, and quite all encompassing within, within the, within the very prescribed definition of American art under which we operate. Um, and so with that, I've rambled on long enough, but I'm uh, really happy. And thank you all so much for staying with me. I'm I'm happy to answer any questions um, that may have appeared in the chat or in the Q&A box. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. There's so, so many fascinating pieces and stories behind them. So thank you. Um, we have a couple questions and feel free to put any that you think of in the Q&A. Um, well, someone had an question about, um, since they were really acquiring a lot of these works in the midst of the Great Depression, one would think maybe they would have gotten some bargains, but is that is that the case or, or not? Oh, they, it's a mix. It's a mixed bag. They were definitely getting, I mean, really everything looks like a bargain by today. If, if we don't factor in for inflation, it, you know, they were um, you know, the most that they spent was around $60,000, which was still a huge sum of money. I mean, when you adjust that for inflation, it's close to a million, if not over a million dollars. So it's a it's a very princely sum of money. Um, I think that people were were more willing to part with works that in their collections, they were people, collectors were hard up for cash. Uh, so I, they definitely did get deals, but um, I would not, I don't think they got any really unbelievably great bargains. And in fact, there are some works that, um, they actually spent more money in 1928, even if you didn't, if you did not adjust for inflation, they spent more money on paintings then that then certain paintings are worth now. Uh, so again, the art market is very fickle. Taste is very fickle. They did, you know, he, he certainly got a deal building the Addison. I think um, that's where a lot of the savings came in because there was ample labor, cheap labor materials where uh, people were, you know, really desperate for work. Uh, so I do think he did get bargains, but I wouldn't say that he got incredible bargains. He um, he doesn't appear to have been a very um, uh, aggressive negotiator. They seem to, you know, they would they would knock off some money from the asking price, but um, he he was also paying commissions on everything. So again, he was not really looking at the bottom line uh, in his own personal finances. This didn't wipe him out by any means, but um, he he was uh, he was willing to spend what it whatever it took. Um, this is a an interesting question. Uh, so when it was founded, what role, if any, were the students of Andover expected to have in the museum? That's, that's an interesting question. So again, the relationship, it's ever evolving. And the relationship between the Addison and Phillips Academy and the students of Phillips Academy um, is, is not the same as it was in the 30s. So this, um, I think it took the school a while to figure out what to make of the Addison. But with the Addison really came the founding of Phillips Academy's art department. Uh, so that was a very natural, um, uh, a very natural um, point of intersection with the curriculum. So a lot of people um, from earlier generations that that came to Andover and had the Addison as a as a as a resource, remember coming to the Addison to take art classes. So there were studios in the basement, painting classes were were taken there. 
Um, you know, Frank Stella has great memories of taking painting classes, going up to check, you know, the color of of the sky in Winslow Homer's eight bells and going back to the basement. So they had this immediate connection with with art. Um, but I don't think it was as well, it was certainly not as well integrated into the curriculum of Phillips Academy as it is today. I think we're better integrated than ever before. There are classes from really every discipline of 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 uh, study here at the academy that come through the Addison. Uh, physics classes come, math classes, sciences, languages, hum the humanities seem obvious. They come, art, art classes come, language classes come, if I haven't mentioned that already. So um, we're very well integrated now. There are student groups that are um, involved with the Addison. We're, we're very well integrated. Then it was this was sort of a place that you would take your parents when they were visiting. You might come in graduation. You would take classes here, but students were not typically spending tons of time here. Um, there are, you know, great stories of sort of secondhand um, engagement. Um, Bill Agee, who is a great art historian who unfortunately passed uh, a few years ago, um, you know, remembers coming with a basketball under his, you know, this jock remembers coming with a basketball under his arm on the way to something else. And he saw, you know, Stuart Davis and that changed his life. So there are these amazing stories of even if they weren't, you know, being taught in front of, of uh, paintings, this resource on campus um, was very important and very influential. So there is, um, and there's also a really interesting um, emergence. There were significant artists who came before the the Addison was open to the public or uh, existed, but you really start to see the the this incredible gener generations of really incredible artists who came out of Phillips Academy's renowned art. Their art education program was really remarkable and also benefited directly from the Addison. So um, George Tucker is maybe one of the first um, to have very explicitly spoken to the influence of, of the Addison on his own artistic journey, but there are, are countless more. So it changes. It's um, the relationship with students is is very strong now. It hasn't always been, um, but hopefully it will continue to be. Um, another question just came in. Um, did Cochran study art history at Phillips Academy? And um, what was his relationship to the Bliss family that, you know, donated so donated so many works? Um, so, um, sorry, what the Sorry, what was the, so sorry. the first the first part? It was a two part. Uh, the yeah. first part was um, did Cochran study art history? At uh, I don't. School? There was there was would not have been an art history curriculum in the. This is, I mean, this is you know Latin and Greek. This is a very what we think of as a very classic nineteenth century education at the time that he came here. Uh, uh, so he would not have had access to, you know, the art history as a field was was not exactly a, a thing um, at that point or certainly not what we think of it today um so he did not benefit from our art history um classes no and then the second part was about the bliss family yeah so um what was his relationship to the bliss family um so he was very good friends socially with um zadie cobb bliss who um was married to cornelius bliss who was the uh, brother of lily bliss um zadie uh, remarried uh, uh, a conjured good year in the 1940s. Um, but I think it was really through her that the Blisses became involved. Uh, they, you know, Cornelius Bliss did not attend Andover. It was really through the strength of their relationship with Thomas Cochran that they became so connected with, um, with the Addison. All right. Okay. Um, Are there any answers? I'm, I'm just making sure I didn't miss anything. Um, I know we talked a lot. I mean, this whole presentation was really about the kind of the founding and the beginning of of everything um, from those first, you know, 58 uh, or so items. But someone was curious about how many items roughly uh, the Addison has now. Uh, so we have uh, around 28,000 works of art in our collection. I'll mention that you know, that might, we don't have 28,000 paintings hanging in storage. We have, um, I think I saw another question that how many paintings do we have? We have around a thousand paintings in our collection, uh, but more than half of our collection is comprised of photographs. And photography very early on 
became a major focus uh, of the Addison's collecting, largely um, for pragmatic reasons. It was affordable and accessible. Um, and so the Addison began collecting photography in 1934, which was uh, before most major museums began to recognize photography as a fine art. So over half of our collection is comprised of photographs, which are, of course, more easily condensed and stored than paintings. Uh, but we do have really strong holdings in, in paintings. We're probably best known for our 19th and 20th century painting collection and our photography collection. We have significant print holdings, significant works on paper. Our sculpture collection is probably the, the least developed out of the group, but we do have some really key works uh, from the 19th century and 20th century. Um, we we continue to collect. We collect uh, new media now. We're expanding um, in many different directions, but um, we do, you know, so it's important to look back at the core as we move forward and, and think about how we got to the point that we're at now. Absolutely. All right. So thank you. Thank you so much for uh, for spending some time with us today. Um, oh, sorry. I this. just saw one question. Yeah, go for uh, it. How open is out? How open to outside visitors is a museum these days? I just want to, I don't, you may have mentioned earlier, the Addison is free always free. That's a really important thing. It's always been free. And as, as long as we're, as long as the Addison exists, I pray we'll be free forever. Um, all of our programs are free. Um, so we are probably the most public program that Phillips Academy offers. We are kind of the point of intersection between Phillips Academy and the outside world. And we take that responsibility, responsibility very seriously. So we actually serve um, as many students from outside of Phillips Academy as we do from inside. We're a major resource for all of the public schools in this area uh, and even farther afield. Um, and, you know, also not just high school age, we we work with um, kids from nursery to PhD students and researchers from around the world come visit us. So we're very open to the outside. It may not seem that way. I, I'm very aware of how, you know, you have to go down this, what seems like maybe a private road to find parking, which is not always super available. Um, we don't have great um, presence on, we have banners, but we don't have, you know, big signs announcing us. But I want everyone who's here to know you can come, please come at any time that we're open. This is as much a community resource as it is an academy resource. And that is such a, such something that we, we are so serious about and we want to serve our community and we see everyone you know, everyone is our community, but not just Phillips Academy. And they're a major part, obviously, um, but we see ourselves as interfacing between these two worlds. And 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 so I urge you all to come. We're totally free. We close during the month of August. There's about a week left of our shows, but then in the fall, we'll have some great new things for you to see. Sorry to, sorry to cut you off. I just, oh, any opportunity I try to, and we do oh, have Eric Sloan. Somebody asked about Eric Sloan. Yeah. We do have Eric Sloan in the collection. Uh, yeah, no, I was definitely going to make sure there was a a, a plug to visit in person um, before we before we sign off. It's it's a wonderful place. Things are changing all the time, so um, I get the pleasure of going to most of the shows for tours because we do um, partner with with you for, it's, it's for in person great. tours, um, and it's there's always something new to see. So I definitely recommend visiting. And um, we're at a high school. If it was always the same, nobody would come. So they knew that very early on. You're not going to get young people, teenagers in here more than once if it's the same dusty painting over and over mm -hmm. again. And another thing that is is great is if you visit multiple times, you'll see the same painting, but in different next to different things. And it, it is really a fascinating way to explore uh, different pieces of art. So. It's it's a great resource right here uh, in Andover. So we're we're fortunate to have it and fortunate to uh, partner with you for so many great programs. Um, Thank you. So, so much. Yeah, and I know I think there were a few people who joined a little late. Um, this was all recorded. I will send a link to the recording, um, and I'll be sure to include a link to the uh, Absence website as well, so um, you can check that out and. Um, Thank, thank you, you so all. much. Thank, yeah, thank you all for, thank joining, you for us. joining us. Yeah. Bye.